Hope that everybody is doing well on this fine rainy day. Uh, we've got a, a lot of announcements to go over, so let's get right into it. Um, your next exam is on Friday, so we're going to have the exam in two days. And uh, as per our previous approach and announced previously, uh, the exam will open on Blackboard at 1130. It's a PDF file that you can either view on screen or print out. And you're going to have two hours to take that exam, and I'm writing that exam as a 50-minute test. And I think I've explained before that a 50-minute test means that there are some students who will probably finish it in 20 or 25 minutes. And the vast majority of students should be able to solve that exam in 50 minutes. Um, but of course, someone who's not prepared or hasn't been studying or didn't do the homework assignment, then no amount of time is going to feel like enough uh, for a few students like that. So uh, take that for whatever you like. And uh, the submission deadline of, uh, of 1.30 p.m. is firm. If you don't upload your exam before the deadline, then I'm not grading it. Um, I refuse to accept uh, email submissions for the exam, so either you leave yourself enough time to get it up on Blackboard or it's not getting graded. So my recommendation is if you live someplace with spotty internet, maybe you should go to a location that has reliable internet for the exam. You know, you're welcome to take the test on campus. Um, public libraries have good internet, so find some place that you can rely on being able to upload your file because um, it needs to be in by 1.30 p.m. The conditions of the exam are that uh, you're allowed to use your textbook, you can review the class notes that I've provided, you can go through your previously solved homework assignments and in-class exercises, but what you're not allowed to do is access any websites, and that includes YouTube. So you shouldn't just be watching a YouTube tutorial during the exam. You're not allowed to refer to any kind of website or any collaboration with another student. So what you produce should be your work individually, and so don't turn in anything that isn't what you yourself have made or figured out. Um, regardless of whether you solve your exam on a blank piece of paper or you've printed it out, you need to upload the PDF file to Blackboard as well as the Excel file because you're going to have a problem, at least one, where you need to use Microsoft Excel during the test. Now, uh, Monday of next week, you have the next homework assignment that's due, and then just the ever-present reminder about the project. Uh, the submission deadline for that is the 21st of April. And I emailed out a couple of tips related to income the other day, so uh, if you have any questions about the project, I'd be glad to hear from you. Just call me on Teams. That's probably the best way for us to communicate on the project. Uh, any questions about these announcements before we move into today's material? Okay, well, uh, today's topic of replacement studies is kind of an extension of Monday's class where we were discussing economic service life. And what you may recall is that economic service life is an analysis that tells you how long to own equipment. And so the kind of decision criteria for economic service life analysis was that you own items for however many years as will minimize the cost. In replacement studies, we're going to apply that same rationale for decision making and comparing alternatives. So in a replacement study, what we're doing is considering a piece of equipment that is already owned and trying to decide whether it should be kept for a certain number of years or if it should be replaced with something new and more sophisticated. Uh, the picture on the left just is to bring to mind and illustrate the idea of there may be a chemical plant that's relying on analog instrumentation and non-automated data gathering, whereas there are more new sophisticated um, control systems available that would allow a remote operator to uh, keep track of the system and maybe for the system to manage itself. You'll notice that in front of all these displays there's no person. So, you know, logging the details and making some decisions could be left up to uh, an AI or a program. But the question is, how long should we hold on to this old equipment from an economic standpoint? What is going to minimize our costs? and maximize profitability. 
That's what a replacement study tries to address. And our overall objective is to minimize the expense of owning equipment. And we assume that an old piece of equipment and a new piece of equipment can both meet required specifications. And so, you know, we still have um, acceptable safety that's coming from the old equipment. We still have acceptable reliability from the old equipment. It's just maybe that its performance is less than the new equipment could be, or it could be that the maintenance and operation costs are elevated compared to what a new piece of equipment would be. So that's one of the assumptions is we assume that they're equally acceptable, uh, just that they have economic differences. Uh, the other assumption is that when we have a study period that's specified, let's say that we know that we want to buy something that's going to last a certain amount of time. You know, if you're considering a car and you want to keep it and hold it for 10 years before you have to replace it again, um, we assume that there are ways that you can match up both alternatives so that the uh, same study duration is available. So for instance, in the case of a vehicle, if you're trying to decide whether to keep your old car or replace it with a new car, when you're comparing those two alternatives, you're assuming that if you keep the old car for just a couple of years, then you'd have some other alternative you could do to get the rest of the study period. Like you could lease a vehicle, or you could buy a different car at the end of the existing equipment's lifespan. So we're just uh, acknowledging the fact that you're supposed to compare options over the same time frame. So we're going to look at two different cases today. And I emailed you a template file a few minutes before class started. You don't need to open that yet, but uh, in that template file we're going to use it to help set up a couple of Excel calculations where we compare alternatives. And in the first example, we're going to be doing a replacement study where there's no particular study period that's been specified. So we're just comparing the existing equipment, which we know as the Defender, to the Challenger, and we'll perform an economic service life analysis for both alternatives. So we did economic service life analysis on Monday, and it's a little bit complicated. I went through the process and you kind of follow it along as I set that up on the spreadsheet. But today, I'm going to pause and ask you to do the economic service life analysis using the template file that I've provided and the instructions that are both on the in-class exercise and the template file, um, just to get a little more practice. So what you do is you perform the economic service life analysis for both alternatives, and then you choose the alternative that has the lowest total annual worth of cost. And so remember the figure that was shown in Monday's class of you have two different components of cost. There's the capital recovery costs that decrease with increasing ownership time. And then there's the annual worth of the annual operating costs, which go up and up the longer you own equipment. So we're trying to find that happy medium that balances the two different expense categories. Now, in a real world scenario, you do an economic service life analysis today, you'd compare alternatives today, and let's say maybe the conclusion of your analysis was to keep your existing equipment, keep the Defender, for three years. In reality, what you do is one year later, you'd revisit the analysis, and you'd gather new pricing data, and you'd put in the updated evaluation of your operating and repair costs. And so you'd revisit and uh, reevaluate on a periodic basis. Just because with this economic service life analysis, we're trying to predict the future. We're trying to predict what our costs will be three, four, five, even more years into the future. And so we're not very good at predicting the future sometime. And it's always a good idea to double check later on. So if, you're, if your conclusion is to own something for a certain number of years, then you'd want to check up on that. All right, so let's take a look at the in-class exercise for today. We have two pages here. The first of them is no study period is specified. So let's just talk about this together 
and set the stage for the economic service life analysis. All right, so we have a robotic system, an existing system. And the existing value of the robotic system is $15,000. So when we have a defender, that's the thing you own now. So our defender is the existing robotic system. And uh, what we previously learned is that the first cost of the defender isn't zero. The equipment that you already own, if you keep it, that means you've lost the opportunity to sell it. So the first cost of the Defender is its existing market value. And so when you set up the spreadsheet, the first cost of this existing equipment is 15000 And we would put a minus sign in there just to represent that it's an outflow. And then that declines by 20% each year for three years. So that declining that, that description of how the value of the equipment is declining, that is going to go into the market value. Now market values are positive because that's how much money you get if you sell the equipment. So although the market value right now, its current market value at time zero, we are listing as an outflow because that's the first cost, you know, the, the opportunity cost we to put positive values in the market value. So if it's declined by 20%, what that means is you need to have 80% of 15,000 in year one, and then 80% of the previous year in row two, and so on. Okay. Now, the, um, the operating costs are described here. It's 20,000 for year one, 8,000 for year two and 12,000 for year three. So we put those operating costs in and then the rest of these columns are labeled and the process for calculating them is the same as we talked about in Monday's class. We're just doing economic service life analysis for the defender and also for the challenger. And so the template file that I've provided you has um, the first cost of the challenger and the defender, three years is how long our defender would last. And the challenger that's being described here, some proposed equipment. It's like a new robotic system. It lasts for six years and we also have a declining market value that's described and it says it's losing 20% each year. So that's how you're going to fill in column B for the challenger. Um, so what we're trying to do is figure out should the company keep the old equipment or buy the new equipment. And the way that you know, you know your, your decision is just whatever gives you the lowest total annual worth of costs. And so we're trying to minimize the annual costs and uh, so we just need to find out for the defender and for the challenger what's the lowest for each and then apply that to uh, to find out which of those has the minimum costs. Alright, so I'm going to pause. Um, I'll put you in the breakout rooms in case you want to chat with your classmates or ask any questions, but really what you ought to be doing is trying to fill in the data in this template file that I've provided. And you can see I've given you the hints on what formulas you should use in each of the cells. And we went over this on Monday, so I'm hoping it's still familiar. So let me pause for a second. I'll give you about uh, 10 minutes to set this up, and then we'll reconvene together and look at the solution um, to make sure that everybody got the, the right answer. OK, welcome back, everyone. We'll just wait a moment. It looks like maybe uh, another person or two are still re connecting from the breakout rooms. Okay, so uh, we need to do the economic service life analysis for both of these alternatives. So let's take a look at what you should have here. So first of all, the problem statement said that our interest rate is 10%. Oops, put that in the wrong field. Our interest rate is 10%, so we put in 0.1. And the, uh, the first cost of the defender is its current market value. And the rationale there is that if you keep it, you're not able to sell it. 
So it's as though you've lost the opportunity to receive $15,000 in revenue. So minus $15,000 since its existing first cost, its existing market value is $15,000. Now what the problem statement said was that the market value um, declines by 20% each year. And so that means uh, in year one, the market value that remains is 80% of the previous first cost. And so we'll say it is 0.8 of 15,000, or we could say equals minus 0.8 times the value up in here. And I put the minus sign in there simply because when we uh, have a market value, that means you're selling it. And so you get the positive revenue if you do dispose of it at the end of a single year. Okay, um, so now the remainder of the uh, market value is just going to be 80% of the previous year. So, oops, uh, equals 0.8 times the cell above it. So 9,600 is 80% of 12,000, which means it's, lo it's lost 20% of its value and 7680 is 80% of the residual value from the year before that. Okay, the problem statement described the operating costs as 20,000, 8,000, and 12,000. So let me put that in, minus 20,000, minus 8,000, and minus 12,000. And now we start to apply the, um, the calculations. You know, these are the instructions that we're given. Maybe I can post the, paste these up top so that we have that in view as we do the calculation. So column D, we need to do the NPV function. So equals NPV, and our rate is 10%. And then for the range so far, that means just the operating costs to date. So it's only just that single year. And then for the rest of them, NPV, rate 10%, and then the range, you may remember the trick that was illustrated in class on uh, Monday. If we anchor the first value in the range, but don't anchor the second value in the range, then what that does is allows us to drag it down. Isn't uh, year one supposed to be 20,000, not 2,000? Oh, was it? Yeah, that, that could be a typo there. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, 20,000, you're exactly right. Thank you. That's going to change the numbers a lot. Okay, uh, and now, so we've got the, uh, the present value of the cumulative operating costs to date. So like for, for example, three years, if we own it for three years, we would experience this in the individual years that it occurs, but we've taken those amounts back to time zero. And now in column E, we're trying to find out what would be the annual equivalent if we then took it from a present value and spread it back out over however many years there are. And so here in column D, we were just using the NPV function, equals NPV, where it's the interest rate and however many amounts we've had up to that point. So if it's year one, there's just been the one year of operating costs. If it's year two, then it would be these two years of operating costs. If it's year three, then it would be the three years of operating costs. Okay. Now, uh, we annualize it. So we're using the payment function. Here it says use the PMT of the amount in column, in column D. So equals uh, PMT. The rate will be the 10%. I'm anchoring the reference by pressing F4. NPER means number of periods, and it's whichever row we're on. And now we have both the... Um, no, we, we only have a present value because these operating costs are at the present value. So I'm going to put the minus because of the sign change thing that Excel does. So you see here it's bold and it's saying it wants to know the present value. This is the amount that's in the present value. Close parentheses. So for the first year, it would just be whatever our single year of operating costs were, but then what, for instance, year three is doing is it's saying instead of having 20, then 8, then 12,000, if you're going to have the same amount every year 
for three years, then that would be 13595 So that's how much you would have to pay every year if it's going to be that you have a constant outflow each year for the operating costs. Capital recovery, remember, is both the inflow and the outflow. So it's taking into account the first cost of an item and its eventual disposal price. Chad says his D is different. Well, I'm pretty confident that this is right. Um, I have my notes here from a previous semester and previous time I've gone through the solution, so I don't know why yours would be different. Uh, could be maybe that you're not anchoring when you drag the formula down, but like for the last column, inside the NPV it should be the interest rate of 10% and then the range should be just these operating costs to date. Okay, capital recovery. We're using the payment field again, PMT, and it asks for a rate, so we click here in the interest rate and anchor that reference. NPER is whichever year we're on. And then for the present value, the amount that's at the present is minus of this first cost. And then it's saying, what is the amount in the future? In that future value field, we put the market value. So minus of the market value. Okay. So the capital recovery takes into account both the initial purchase price of the item and how much you can sell it for at the end of however long you own it. Oh, I think I didn't anchor something the way I ought to have. Yes, I need to anchor the reference up here to the first cost. So let me put the dollar signs in there. And then when I drag it down through, I think I will get the values I'm looking for. Okay, so that's the capital recovery. And the total costs add together operating and capital recovery. So column G is column E and column F. Okay, so of these three years, the cheapest option, here's our lowest cost. Let me show the capital recovery again. So the description here for capital recovery is you put in the first cost and the market value, both into the same function. So that's what we're going to be doing here. What we're doing is described here for column F. It's the payment function with two values put inside two amounts. Okay, so let me do the capital recovery again. So it's equals PMT, because we're finding an annualized equivalent. Click here for the interest rate. Anchor the reference with the dollar signs. And number of periods is the year. Now it's asking for the PV. For this defender, the amount that's at the present is the first cost. So I'm going to click on the first cost cell, but I'll put the minus sign first there just because of the sign change that Excel does. And then in the future value field, that's where we put the market value. Just by definition, capital recovery is the annualized difference between the purchase price at time zero and the salvage or market value in whatever year you dispose of the equipment. So I'm going to put the minus of the market value. Okay, And then I can drag that down as long as I anchor the reference up to the first cost, which I forgot to do again. All right, so I'll drag that through. And now we can see that the lowest option, if we keep the Defender, is to own it for three years. But what we don't know yet is how the Challenger stacks up. So we have to do the same procedure for the Challenger. This is good practice a replacement study because we're doing economic service life two times. Okay, so the, uh, the first cost of the Challenger was 50000 The market value was that it decreased, oh, I need to put another zero in there, 50000 And the market value decreases by 20% each year. So that means for the first year, it was 80% of the first cost. 
and I put the minus sign in there just to turn it from an outflow to an inflow because when you sell the item, you get revenue. And then each subsequent year is 80% of the year before that. Okay. Um, now the operating costs, that distribution was described as uh, 5,000 in year one, then increases by 2,000 each year after that. So it's going to be five, seven, nine, and so on. Okay, so it is an outflow of $5,000, and then each additional year beyond that is another $2,000 more in outflow. So it goes 5,000, 7,000. So the formula I did there is I said the cell above it minus another 2,000. Okay. You could also just put in the first two numbers and then continue the pattern. That's another way of filling that in. Or you could have typed it in manually. Okay, so the PV of cumulative operating costs to date, remember that's where we're using the NPV function. So it is equals of NPV. Our reference to the interest rate is this 10% way up here. Okay. And then for the first year, it is just that. But then for the next year, NPV interest rate up here, anchor the reference. Okay, the next year it would be these first two. And then I'm going to use that trick of putting in the dollar signs for the first value in the range, and then that'll allow me to drag the formula down so I don't have to type it six times. So the, uh, the first part of the NPV function is the interest rate reference, and then the rest of it is defining the range of values that goes into the NPV function. Remember, the NPV function should only ever have amounts that are already in the future. And these operating costs amounts are in the future. They're in year one, two, three, and so on. Okay, so I can drag this formula down and get the present worth of the cumulative operating costs to date. And then we annualize that with the payment function, PMT, referring up to our interest rate, number of periods, and then this amount is in the present, but I have to put the minus sign because Excel always changes directions if we don't manually override that. And I can drag that formula down since my reference up to the interest rate was anchored. So what that means is that instead of having different operating costs every year, then this would represent paying the same amount every year for the operating costs for however long you're owning the item. So if you're owning the item for four years, instead of having five, then seven, then nine, then 11, what we're saying is you could either do that for four years, or you could have four payments of 7,762, and that is economically equivalent. Capital recovery. So payment field, a uh, payment function, the reference up to the interest rate, anchor that, and now NPER, number of periods, so it will be one. The present value amount is the uh, reference up to the first cost, and I'm going to anchor that because I can drag this formula down as long as I always refer up to the same first cost, but then the future value it's asking for is going to be the market value. So. Okay. Uh, looks like I may have put something in the wrong spot here. Let's see. Oh, I forgot the minus sign. So I've got to have a minus sign for both the present value and the future value. Okay, so I can drag that formula down. 
Aaron had a question about the second row of the PV of the cumulative. So here it is. Remember that if you anchor the first cell in a range, then that allows you to drag the formula down through additional rows, and it always looks at the first cell, but then subsequent rows would have a different bottom value for the range. All right. Okay, so uh, the total costs are going to be capital recovery and annual worth of the present value of the cumulative operating costs to date. That's a mouthful. Okay, so if we own it for one year, what would be the overall cost be? And so on and so forth. And it, what it looks like is that the lowest of all of these, what we do in a replacement study is we compare the defender and the challenger, and the lowest of both is to keep the defender for three years. That's how you can minimize your costs. So that's cheaper than any of the alternatives having to do with the, ch uh, the challenger. And so our overall conclusion, we should keep the defender for three years. All right. Well, it's 1247. I don't think that in the next three minutes we're going to get through this next part of the in-class exercise. You know, the, that's okay. This next in-class exercise was really just some practice in cash flow diagrams and the table method. So what I was going to ask you to do is find the annual equivalent of both of these cash flows for the challenger and for the defender. So like, for example, you already know the annual operating cost of the challenger. You'd have to take this present value and spread it out over the cash flow diagram. And for this variety of different cash flow diagrams, you would have to either take it to the future or the present and then spread it out over A. So this one was just some more practice with the uh, cash flow diagrams. Chad, is there a certain thing in the Excel that you'd like to take a look at? Any, uh, any one of the formulas that I need to explain another time? Okay, well before we wrap up for today, um, let me uh, remind you that Friday is our exam. So we, that means we won't have class on Friday, obviously. Uh, the exam will become available at 11.30. You need to upload it, I'd say maybe start thinking about uploading the file at 1.20 p.m. or maybe even earlier. That way you've given yourself a little bit of breathing room and aren't scrambling at the last second. Um, if you have any questions as you study, feel free to give me a call on Teams or you could send me an email. And I'll be glad to help you out if there's anything that you need to uh, go over another time as you prepare for the test. So that's it for today. Thanks everybody. Hope you have a good one.